Welcome to NeuroPsyQ. I'm Rachel, a neuroscience student at University College London, here with the Diamandis Lab. Since the dawn of the digital era, analogies have been drawn between the recurrent motifs of bits in our computers and the human brain's computational units, the neuron. Strong parallels exist between the data processing of individual neurons and simple synaptic networks and their silicon counterparts. Recent advancements in computer science have shown that the complexity of our brain's higher order processing may someday be replicated as well through artificial neural networks. In fact, by mimicking what we learn about neural networks in the brain, computers have, for the first time, been able to achieve superhuman performance in complex pattern recognition tasks. To understand how computer science mimics neural circuitry, we must first explore what characteristics of neurons can be translated and which are incompatible with digital systems at the moment. Today, we'll be investigating neural computation, both how the neurons of the brain process information and how that process is mimicked by artificial neural networks. Before we start, we need to make an absolutely critical distinction between the different types of signal, digital and analog. The signals that we're talking about are time varying quantities. In electrical engineering, the quantity that's time varying is usually voltage. Neurons operate the same way. Analog signals are when there's no discontinuity between the data being presented. From the initial value, it can fluctuate up and down, but it's a continuous stream of information. Digital signaling, however, is in finite chunks. The easiest analogy to think between these are analog versus digital clocks. In an analog clock, the hands could point to any degree on the entire circumference. Digital clocks, however, are more precise, but they count up in finite units. Now let's investigate how neurons operate. It's very popular, even among neuroscientists, to think of the neuron firing as a binary event. Early models of neurons assumed this was the case. If this were true, then biological neural networks would in principle be able to implement a binary code. The neurons that fire action potentials are the ones, and the neurons that don't are the zeros. Like binary logic, the spiking state of a neuron is precise. It either fires or it doesn't. And it's consistent across all of the outgoing synapses. This fact is shared by computers. If a data line on a circuit board has a one state, then that will be identical across all outbound connection points. Therefore, neurons can be approximated as binary, so long as you look at them within the correct time scale. If you look at the voltage of a neuron over two to four milliseconds, it's possible to approximate the voltage pattern in time as a stream of ones and zeros. However, the flattening of neuronal function to these on and off states does neglect the complexity of information processing that goes into deciding whether the action potential takes place. On any time scale smaller than around one millisecond, action potentials look like analog signals. They show a continuous fluctuation in voltage, and the shape of the fluctuation depends on a variety of factors, like the type of neuron, cell membrane excitability, and of course, the variety of stimuli present. Neuron cell bodies are constantly adding up the excitatory and inhibitory synaptic input both in time, called temporal summation, and over the area of their dendrites, called spatial summation. This is a process called synaptic integration, and the resulting change of voltage may be of any magnitude, so that the resulting state cannot be flattened into either a one or a zero. Information may also be passed between the neurons in a way that doesn't directly affect the resultant membrane voltage, but rather changes the more long-lasting characteristics, such as the cell's permeability, the number of receptors, and the future excitability. Neuromodulatory neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine are responsible for this. Now that we've established the characteristics of the neurons themselves, let's look at how these individual building blocks can be combined to establish small circuits called motifs. So here you can see the motifs. The first is feedforward excitation, which allows one neuron to relay information to its neighbor. Next, you can see feedforward inhibition, where a presynaptic cell excites an inhibitory interneuron that then inhibits the following cell. Next, you can see convergence and divergence. Next, lateral inhibition is where the activity of a single cell in the circuit 
causes the inhibition of its neighboring cells through the loop that you see there using an inhibitory neuron. Next, you can see feedback and recurrent inhibition, where either the excitation of one cell leads to the excitation of the one downstream, which in itself then inhibits the initial cell's functioning. This is quite useful to prevent a snowballing effect of excitation, as once a signal has been passed along, it's shut down from the starting point. Next, you can see feedback and recurrent excitation. Now this is one that amplifies the signals from their initial starting point. The next level of understanding is at the level of the neuron networks that are responsible for higher order processing. Understanding of these networks is becoming possible through the use of electrophysiological and optical recording techniques and modern imaging, such as fMRI and diffusion tensor imaging. Now that we've established how biological neurons compute, let's look at how they can be rendered artificially. Artificial neural networks use different layers of mathematical processing to make sense of the information that they're fed. An ANN uses anywhere from dozens to millions of artificial neurons, which are represented by the circles. They're then arranged into a series of layers. First, the input layer receives various forms of information from the outside world. They take in the data that the network aims to process or learn about. From the input unit, the data goes through one or more hidden layers. Deep learning refers to when there are multiple hidden layers used in the network. The hidden unit's job is to transform the input into something that the output unit can use. These connections are weighted, which is the computer's approximation for synaptic strength. And essentially, the higher the number, the greater influence the initial unit can have on another. As the data goes through each unit, the network is learning more about the data. On the other side of the network is the output units, and this is where the network responds to the data it was given and that it's just processed. Cognitive neuroscientists have learned a tremendous amount about the brain since computer scientists first attempted to create the original artificial neural network. One of the things they learned is that the different parts of the brain are responsible for processing different aspects of information, and these parts are arranged hierarchically. So input comes into the brain, and each level of neuron provides insight, and then the information gets passed onto the next, more senior level. Now that is precisely the mechanism that artificial neural networks are trying to replicate. The purpose of developing these systems is ultimately to automate processes that prior to this point have required human minds to complete. In many regards, the human brain still remains the strongest information processing unit in the known universe. But in specific sectioned activities, computers are performing with higher consistency and durability than humans performing the same task. This may feel like the human race is at risk of a computer takeover, but it's really no different to how we use emails to send information today rather than relying on the manual issues of snail mail. Let's look at a real world implementation of these technologies. Some of the research here at the Diamandis lab is trying to understand the similarities and differences in how our brains and computers learn. This helps better assess a potential application of deep convolutional neural networks in diagnostic medicine and other pattern recognition tasks one of our recent studies, published in Nature Machine Intelligence this past July, took advantage of a large collection of nearly 850,000 histology images, generated from over 1,000 patients with approximately 70 different types of brain tumors, to try and understand the salient features that a computer focuses on to understand and organize histology data. When a pathologist is given a test case, say, an H&E slide of a tumor. Separate but interconnected neural circuitry is responsible for processing the visual stimulus, pulling insights from memory, and focusing the attention on the relevant details for diagnosis. The sheer multitude of layers that the information passes through means that the system as a whole can, as of yet, only be understood as a black box, where the inputs and outputs are the only transparently available data. Thankfully, it's easier to ask a human to explain to us how they came to a specific diagnosis, which provides some transparency to this system and allows us to learn from errors and provide safeguards for future challenging cases. Deep learning, and you'll remember that refers to neural networks with multiple hidden layers, behaves much in the same way. Like in the brain, 
we can easily evaluate how good a system is at recognizing objects based on its classification decisions. Unfortunately, asking computers to explain how it made some sort of decision has been a challenge. This mere lack of transparency limits our ability to apply these powerful tools in high stakes situations like cancer diagnosis. Instead of looking at the network as a whole, our team deconstructed the information within the network into smaller units so that they can be analyzed separately, much like an isolated circuit in the brain. Indeed, this work highlighted that in fact, specific components of these artificial neural circuits learn to analyze pathology images much like human experts. For example, they showed that the computer recognized the common glandular epithelial and luminal components of various metastatic lesions and could use these similar features to group together otherwise unrelated tumors into coherent classes of brain tumors, much like the expert pathologists do. Impressively, these same neurons fired when the features were encountered in tumor types that the computer had never seen before, highlighting that deep learning networks may be capable of learning and understanding some of the same patterns that humans use to classify images. This work has multiple implications for both medical diagnosis and neuroscience. One of the spectacular powers of the human brain is that some of the key features that differentiate classes can be recognized almost instantaneously with little supervision or training. The advent of deep convolutional neural networks in this study is not only its ability to increase the efficiency of diagnosis through automation, but to give insight into what those subconscious diagnostic decisions being made are by being able to examine how the artificial networks inspired by the brain fire when the images are seen. These correlations stand to create a symbiosis between the humans and neural computing. As artificial intelligence development races ahead, it may give us insight into the biological systems that we first drew inspiration from. Similarly, perhaps the better we understand the biology of the neurons that make humans unique, the better we can model and automate higher level cognitive ability in computers. In this video, we explored the characteristics of neurons and whether they act as binary agents. Next, we discussed circuit motifs that make up the macrocircuitry of the brain. We introduced how these neural systems are approximated by artificial neural networks and how their functions share similarity with their biological sisters. From all of us here at NeuroPsyQ, thank you for watching.